Everyone, thanks so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Super. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Thanks to everyone for uh, joining this session. Uh, so yeah, so as we mentioned, um, the focus of today's session is uh, funder perspectives on meta science. Um, I'm just going to give a few introductory comments. I don't want to take too much time away from our speakers and the Q&A session. Um, and then I'll go forward and introduce each panelist and and then we'll take it away. Um, I'll just ask everyone to put their questions in the Q&A section and then we'll get to those uh, after everyone has had a chance to, to present. Uh, so yeah, essentially the session today again focuses on meta science from a funder perspective. Um, the rise of meta science raises some complicated issues for, for funders, uh, especially those who are principally supporting kind of traditional forms of basic research, such as original data gen generation and hypothesis driven uh, discovery science. So when and how to make decisions to support uh, meta science can be a challenge, um, again, especially for life science funders who are focusing more on translational uh, bench research. So really, um, we're looking at a mindset change uh, that's required for a funder to kind of embrace meta science um, as original scholarship, uh, contributing to the advancement of knowledge and that addresses uh, kind of societal concerns. So, so during this session, we're gonna hear from both uh, public and private funders. They're gonna discuss when and how they've supported uh, meta science research, what they see as the opportunities, but also what they see as the challenges as, as we move forward with more uh, support for meta science. Uh, so we have four uh, excellent panelists today. Um, I think we're gonna go in uh, the following order. So first we'll hear from Arthur, then Susan, then Nick, and then Dawood, if that's okay with everyone. And then we'll take questions at the end of the, at the, end of the session. Uh, so I'm gonna present each of our panelists. Uh, first, we're gonna hear from Arthur Lupia. Um, Dr. Arthur Lupia is, is the Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation and serves as head of NSF's uh, Directorate for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences. He's the Gerald uh, R. Ford Distinguished University Professor at the University of Michigan and co-chair of the National Science and Technology Council's uh, Subcommittee on Open Science. Uh, his research and related public work examines processes, principles, and factors that guide decision-making and learning. Uh, his efforts clarify how people make decisions and choose what to believe what, uh, when they face adverse uh, circumstances. So he's been a, a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, and is a recipient of the National Academy of Sciences Award for Initiatives in Research. He earned a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Rochester and social science PhD at the California Institute of Technology. Um, we'll then move on to uh, Susan Fitzpatrick. So she's the president of the James S. McDonald Foundation. As president, uh, she also serves as um, the foundation's chief executive officer. Um, Susan received her PhD in biochemistry and neurology from Cornell University Medical College and pursued postdoctoral training with in vivo anima, uh, spectro uh, yeah. spectroscopy study. Susan can pronounce that word for you better than I can. Uh, brain metabolism function in the Department of uh, Molecular Biochemistry and Biophysics at Yale University. Uh, Ms. Patrick is an adjunct, uh, adjunct associate professor of neuroscience and occupational therapy at Washington University School of Medicine and teaches neuroscience in both lectures and seminars. Uh, she lectures and writes on issues concerning applications of neuroscience to clinical problems, uh, translation of cognitive neuroscience to educational settings, and the role of private uh, philanthropy in the support of scientific research and on issues related to public dissemination of uh, an understanding of science. Uh, we'll then move on to uh, Nicholas Gibson, who is the Director of Human Sciences at the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, he's responsible for developing grant programs on the scientific study of religion and non-religion, the psychology of virtues and character strength, and the interface between uh, spirituality and health. He has a particular interest in projects taking a cognitive approach to these areas. Uh, Dr. Gibson studied psychology and physiology at the University of Oxford and received his PhD in psychology um, of religion from the University of Cambridge. He was subsequently a, re a research fellow in science and religion at Queens College, Cambridge, where he also taught uh, social psychology. And then we'll move on to uh, Dawid Potgeiter, I hope I pronounced that correctly, <laughs> um, is the director of programs in discovery science at the Templeton World Charity Foundation. He's responsible for the foundation's new initiatives in the discovery phase. 
Uh, so this includes the Grand Challenges for Human Flourishing, uh, which is a $40 million effort to support interdisciplinary scientific research on humans' cognitive, affective, social, and spiritual well-being. Uh, he develops new initiative and grant proposals in a wide range of areas, such as natural sciences, philosophy, and public outreach activities. Uh, in 2018, he launched the Accelerating Research on Consciousness Initiative, which involves a $30 million commitment from the foundation to investigate scientific theories of consciousness through adversarial collaboration and by promoting open science practices. So uh, he also serves as head of program management and continuous improvement and leads the foundation's efforts to promote best practices in open science. And he's also responsible for overseeing uh, changes to policies and procedures and developing new grant making practices to better support discovery science. And I just realized I should probably introduce myself. <laughs> so I'm Erin McKiernan. I am the community manager for the Open Research Funders Group, of which several of our funders here are our members. And so I will be moderating today's session, and I think I will hand over the floor to Arthur. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, whatever applies to you. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you, and I'm very grateful for uh, everything that's going on in, in, in the Meta Science uh, Conference. I haven't been able to attend all of it, but uh, it, it's really a very important thing. Um, let me, Aaron asked us to talk about two things. One is about NSF's kind of funding orientation, and I'm going to dispense with that quickly. Uh, we fund a lot of work in this domain. We want to fund more, uh, but we want to do so in a particular way. And so what I want to shift to now are the challenges and opportunities of, of doing that. So the stakes of this venture are incredibly high. Uh, and what I'd ask people to do for a moment is to feel the urgency of doing science in a way that really leads to, whether in the short run or the long run, tangible, substantial improvements in people's quality of life. Um, so as we think about that, I want to show you a couple of slides. Um, and just the first thing I want uh, us to think about is gratitude. Uh, we have these opportunities to, to do research, uh, to discover. Uh, it's an incredible thing, but it happens in the context of urgency. There are people around the world, most of whom uh, it is hard for us to see when we're at academic conferences or in universities, uh, but they are there. They have tremendous challenges. Uh, they have existential crises uh, of the type that, again, it, it can be hard to imagine, but many of them are looking desperately for ways to get through the day or to reconcile a set of aspirations that they have or needs that they have with actions they can take. And so there's, there's an incredible uh, urgency to this. And so I wanna give two things to think about as we think about how to respond to that in a meta science con context. The first is something that should make you feel good, which is think about what science has done uh, in the context of connecting people, in the context of health, in the context of building interpersonal relationship in relations and institutions that help people serve one another and discover. So that's, that's good. Now, if you want to feel challenged, think about the amazing talent in this room and in rooms like it, you know, across many countries and across the world. Now think about the difference between what science does and what science could do. I love us, that difference is vast. And when we think about the urgency of the situation in which many people find themselves, that gap is not just a theoretical construct, it's a topic of great concern. And when you work in the public sector, when you work in government, you, you see that uh, straight away. So there's this question, we have urgency. I'd ask you to feel the urgency from the perspective, not of the scholar, but from the people who we could help. And then the question is, what do they need from us most? And I would say that the thing they need from us most is fidelity, right? And by fidelity, I mean, when we articulate a view of the world, when we talk about how one thing might or might not cause another, the fidelity is the relationship between that claim and the reality in which they live, right? Uh, so many of the conversations we have here are about scientific practices that sometimes degrade that fidelity, 
right? But fidelity is the key thing that people need from us because what we do can inform uh, their understanding of the relationship between what outcomes they need and what choices they have. Fidelity of the scientific process matters generally because the other thing they need from us is legitimacy. Many times we find things that people don't wanna see. We say things that people don't want to hear or that are uncomfortable to hear. And yet hearing these things can help people make decisions that improve quality of life. Uh, a bridge that helps people hear and understand and think about things that are uncomfortable is the notion of legitimacy. That is, I may not agree with what you're saying when I first hear it, but I have some sense of how you came to that understanding. And that gives me a bridge to thinking about how I might incorporate what you're saying into my life, into my actions and so forth. So fidelity and legitimacy are the key things that we think. And if you're asking about what is the orientation of the National Science Foundation towards meta-science, it's creating new opportunities for fidelity and legitimacy on concerns that matter most to people. All right, so now I wanna say something that might be controversial. Uh, in this context, what are the outcomes of interest? So I'll put three on the screen here. I might put three on the screen. One is replication and reproducibility. And what I'd like to do for a moment is give the counter argument as to why this might not be the thing that we care about. Okay, I, I like replication and reproducibility, but if we think about fidelity and legitimacy, um, what I'm gonna call r and &R, because I only have a few minutes, um, it's really, it's most useful for evaluating intersubjective properties of a design finding relationship. That is evaluating the relationship between a research design and a claim that you make. R&R &R can be useful for in improving the fidelity or accuracy of that relationship, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient for doing so, right? R&R &R isn't necessary because a, a researcher can get it right the first time, right? With a method that you can all see, Yep, that, that's actually how it works. And so R&R &R isn't necessary. And it also isn't sufficient because we can replicate or reproduce flawed designs. Uh, moreover, if we replicate a single time, right, there's questions about the generality. My point here is, is not to say that replication and reproducibility aren't important. The question is, uh, uh, what I wanna say is they are important for a higher reason. And as we think about which R&R &R studies to fund, Right, uh, it is through the filter of which lead us to which produce fidelity and legitimacy that are of the greatest public value. A similar argument could be made with quality of publications. Publications have lots of measurable attributes, uh, which are the ones that that we care about. And again, you know, I'll, I'll talk about careers and citations too. These are critical to empowering scientists to act in a particular way. But if you approach a US government agency for research funding, uh, we care about you. But at the end of the day, we have a responsibility in the US government to every person who lives in the country. And so the way that we see the request is, how can we take the amazing things that only science can do and do them in a way that create fidelity and legitimacy on some of the most important topics of our day? So these outcomes of interest, how important are they? They are important but they are important from the government perspective if they affect lives, quality of life, length of life, the quality of lived experience, right? These are the things that motivate us. These are the things that we care about. And when meta science proposals come to us that have a capacity for doing this, we are interested. And the more decoupled they are from that, it's just harder to make that case not because we're not inherently interested in other things, it's because anybody who's looked at NSF knows we can only fund about one out of every five proposals that we get. So we have to make very difficult choices and we have a fiduciary responsibility to every person in this country. And so lives are what it's about. Moreover, a meta science study that not just has a bridge to quality of life, but empowers people to serve one another more effectively, to improve one another's lives more effectively, that is even more interesting to us. We can do it in the confines of basic research. It can be very abstract, but a research agenda that has the ability to empower people to better serve others, that's even higher. Because ultimately, I think from our perspective, science is service. 
It's awesome. It's wonderful. The interactions are great. The discovery is great. But at the end of the day, what justifies the existence of the National Science Foundation is that science is a form of service, a way that we serve one another. And so I'm so grateful for the conversations that we're having here, for people putting this together. Gratitude is the main feeling I have about this organization, about this, this effort. And MetaScience is, is the answer to a lot of these questions. Uh, it's just, I think we will have the maximum impact if we think about you know, the main dependent variable being, how do we better serve others? And uh, with that, I yield. Great, thanks so much. And if you could please put your questions for Arthur in the Q&A and we'll get to those after everyone has had a chance to speak. So we'll now move on to Susan. Susan, you have the floor. Good morning, again, afternoon and evening to everyone. And I wanna really thank my colleague from the National Science Foundation because I think he has queued up uh, this session um, just perfectly. So I'm gonna to try to build a little bit on, on what he said and give um, a more, uh, maybe smaller scale perspective from a funder that uh, is not the size of, of the National Science Foundation. So JSMF, the James S. McDonald Foundation is 70 years old, um, much like uh, the National Science Foundation. We were probably founded in the same year of 1950. Um, and we are both actually embedded even though NSF is a government funder, unlike the foundation, which is a private funder, we are both embedded in a history of um, what was philanthropic support for science before the government got into this, that really um, tried to take an international approach and in the ideas that we looked at our questions was um, using what we call foundation initiated um, funding schemes. So rather than just sitting and waiting for stuff to come out over the transom, you would go out and look and identify potential areas of funding. And that the, um, and for the foundation in particular, we were often looking for projects that would uh, question assumptions. You know, the everyone knows X, but actually when you push on it, nobody knows X. Or the, or, the, or the evidence for X is a little sketchy, right? Or that would question dogma and orthodoxy um, so that we could go back and revisit questions and say, do we, are we actually certain that we know what we know? So with that, our mission is also um, stated by Mr. McDonald, our founder, to improve the quality of life. And we have done that primarily through knowledge acquisition and it's responsible application. This was an extremely important component of Mr. McDonald's vision, that knowledge both has great power for good and for evil. And so the responsible application, which means that we have to know what we're doing and we have to be certain and we have to be willing to be humble about our own knowledge. And I think that was an incredibly important part of what we do. So as part of that, the foundation has always supported not just um, fundamental empirical or discovery research, but has often had components of our programs that would support with the research of philosophers, historians, science technology studies researchers. But these were embedded in the programs. So there was not dedicated streams of support for this. They were considered integral to the to the overall goal of this funding initiative. So we did not wanna make big distinctions between someone who was doing empirical research, you know, standing at the bench or out in the field and someone who might be doing um, what would now, I guess the term would be used, meta-science research, right? People who were doing deep analyses, people who were taking retrospective and prospective um, looks at a field, people who were really I'm trying to uh, review and aggregate information and who are questioning the practices by which science works. So that's something that we have, um, have made a core and, and hopefully will always continue to make a core. But now I wanna, I wanna step away in some way like how, how um, Skip did and kind of challenge the field a little bit because as someone who's you know, this is the, the one of the beauties. So I've been at the foundation for 28 years. So, you know, I, I'm speaking now, you know, from somebody who's, you know, seen things come around and go around, you know, multiple times. Um, 
so my own experience with what happened in fields like science, technology studies, um, the field of brain, brain, mind, and education, um, an NSF initiative that I was quite involved in as an active uh, provocateur, which was the science of science policy, is that these fields have a tendency to fall into the trap of becoming their own unique academic disciplines. And so suddenly they develop a jargon, journals, their own society meetings, and they're preaching and talking to one another and they lose touch with the very practitioner community that they need to be actively engaged with if they're going to have the kind of impact and influence that they wanna have for the goals that I think Skip did a beautiful job laying out. What we actually want is knowledge that is useful, that has a fidelity with the world and then can be put to service. And so if you're, if you're developing a very insular view of your field where you are only writing and discussing and talking and now getting into little internecine warfares about who's five step, you know, five bullet uh, identification of the problem looks different than someone's six step identification of the problem. And actually you're using different words for the same thing, using the same words for very different things. And now you get into a, a back and forth argument, papers get generated. And, and now what, what's the service? Where's, where's, where's the point? So I do have to, in some ways, um, commend the work of the Center for Open Science because I think they have really worked to avoid this and have remained very in touch, very connected, very concerned and continuing this two-way relationship between the practitioner community that you really wanna be interacting with and the meta-science community because in reality, you are scholars contributing to the same goal. And so I don't, I, I think, Remaining connected is extremely important. And changing this um, culture. I mean, I think by remaining embedded in the practitioner culture, you also have a better likelihood of, of bringing about this change in what is valued that I think many of us share. And I, I'm sure, again, most of the um, individuals who are dedicating their careers to doing this kind of work really care about this. I'm gonna sort of finish up by just talking because um, fortunately one of our panelists who was originally supposed to be here, Mary Rose um, Franco from the Health Research Alliance is not able to be here. And thanks to Erin for stepping in. But so I wanna put on my little HRA hat for a minute and just talk about biomedical research, which is a huge sprawling enterprise, highly resourced, made of incredibly numbers of interacting parts, right? And even though it has the tradition of meta-analysis and doing uh, comprehensive reviews, still thinks the idea of doing meta-research is somewhat other than the all-important work of generating original data, right? Even if that original data, and I'm gonna steal from Skip here, is unlikely to have any fidelity to the natural world <laughs> or have any legitimacy, in terms of addressing the needs of, of patient and, and health communities, right? So I think there, just as the meta science community is, is reaching out and working closely with practitioners, I think there is a real educational effort that needs to go on with the funding community, and particularly this group of, fund, of funders who are disease specific and who represent disease advocacy communities about why generating this kind of meta-science knowledge is exactly in their lane, because what they care about is knowledge for use. And we have to have more confidence in the kind of work that is coming out of preclinical and early clinical studies so that we don't continually fail at late stage clinical investigations and then enrolling this out to try to do the things that we wanna do. So I would um, encourage this community to sort of you know, focus on those goals, on those bigger, the goals that sort of launched this meta science effort and has engaged so many people and, and to work hard to um, 
avoid the devolution into um, becoming mainly uh, a, a closed shop in which you're, you're, you're mainly now writing and talking to one another. I, I also threw into the chat a recent uh, initiative that the Health Research Alliance put on, which was called uh, Reimagining the Biomedical Research Enterprise for a Healthy Future. Um, this was an international essay contest. We asked people just to write in their ideas about how we could create a more inclusive, um, you know, responsive sort of biomedical community um, that yesterday was the culminating event of this in which we heard from those that were selected as, as the two winners of the essay contest and some of the honorary mentions. And so that's all available on the link that I put into the chat. And I'd really encourage this community particularly to take a look at that because there are some really wonderful ideas, including using pre-registration for clinical trials, which I think could have had, a, could can have a giant impact. So thank you, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Susan. And thanks for mentioning uh, that uh, essay contest. Again, just to, to second that, there's some great essays in there. So I'd, I'd recommend uh, folks check that out. All right, uh, so we will move now to uh, Nick. Thank you very much, Erin, and uh, thank you, Susan and, and Skip, for uh, those really good introductory remarks for this session. Um, I am trying something that I haven't done live before, which is to queue up a PowerPoint deck as a, a virtual background. So um, we're going to see if this works or not, uh, as it is, I don't know, recompiling my slides. Here we are. Uh, hopefully you can see me and uh, see that slide. So uh, what I'd like to do in, in, in the time that I have is, is to ground these, these thoughts in, in the practical realities of uh, obtaining funding from, in this case, a private funder for meta science. And uh, uh, so I start by, by agreeing with the, with the perspective of, of Arthur and Susan on uh, this endeavor of meta science, uh, but also want to think about uh, why a given funder does or does not fund meta science and why a given funder might do so, but think of it in some different terms. So uh, what I wanna do is help prepare you to, to, to pitch, in this case, to the John Templeton Foundation um, your meta science proposals in a way that are more likely to get supported by us. So to do that, I want to briefly introduce you to the founder of the John Templeton Foundation, Sir John Templeton, a Wall Street financier, uh, um, the, the Warren Buffett of his day, uh, who, who died in, in 2008, a, a global value investor, went out looking for undervalued stocks uh, around the world um, uh, bought when others were selling and sold when others were buying. And uh, it, he wanted to take this approach to think about uh, the generation of knowledge. And uh, he, he founded three foundations, John Templeton Foundation, the Templeton World Charity Foundation, and the, uh, let's see, there, there it is, the Templeton Religion Trust. Um, two of them located in the Bahamas, and, and Dawid will speak to one of those in a moment. Uh, and uh, one of them located just out, outside Philadelphia in, in Pennsylvania, USA. Um, but all three have a very similar mission and a very similar charter. There's a broad array of, of goals. You can view our, our individual websites and think, are, are, are all these goals the same? And, 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 and they are. In fact, um, different uh, foundations might choose to prioritize different aspects of that mission at any one time. Uh, but we're all bound by the charters that, that we have and in which uh, Sir John said, I want you to fund these sorts of questions and to do so enduringly, um, that these questions will lead to other similar kinds of, but even deeper questions and carry on doing that, even though um, it, it'll be hard to, to find answers to some of these questions. Uh, what he didn't want to do was to be moved around 
quickly or, or have his foundations moved around by whatever the, the, the current fad or, or urgent priority of the day was. Uh, instead, he had this, this long-term uh, outlook informed by his investment strategy of how do you prevent future poverty? How do you solve the problems of tomorrow um, today? Uh, so when we're thinking about whether to fund uh, a project that is on meta-science or meta-science adjacent in some way, then we're, we're trying to see how does this fit into our broader mission. We have an open submission call. Uh, right now it's, it's once a year uh, for letters of intent or online funding inquiries, as we call them. And uh, we received well over 2,000, uh, 2,400 or so um, back in, uh, in August. And so we're busy reviewing those right now. And we will reject more than 90% of those um, and invite um, the, the remainder, invite a full proposal and, and hope to fund about uh, half to two thirds of those. Um, but so when do we decide what to invite and, and why? I'm gonna give you three quotes from three of Sir John's books um, and the reason I'm doing that is because um, within his charter, uh, he said, uh, I, I, can't, I can't begin to describe all the things that I, I want the foundations to fund, except I've written about them in these books. Um, there are seven books named in the charter. I'm gonna give you quotes from, from three of them. And um, five of those seven books talk about the self-correcting nature of science. So uh, here's, here's one from, his 1994 book, Is God the Only Reality? Uh, and, he, and he describes science. Even though science is a social product, the social factors are limited by the unique corrective character of scientific activity. The continuous filtering and sifting that go on in the course of experimental collaboration and scientific interaction and publication lead to a progressive elimination of distortion. So it sounds... Um, like how science should work. Uh, we can ask whether it does work that way, um, but, but uh, it, uh, he, he certainly had this view of science as, as self-correcting. This is a good way of answering the sort of big questions he had, in other words. Uh, here's another quote from his 2000 book, Possibilities. And you'll see, I, I, I didn't read the subtitle there, actually it's Possibilities for, for over 100 uh, over 100 fold more spiritual information. He had a, a, a particular way of, of, of thinking about the world and the universe um, that was often couched in the language of, of spirituality. But, um, but throughout that, uh, 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 an, an affirmation of science is the way to, to answer those questions. So here's, um, here's this quote from Possibilities. Um, As part of a historical legacy of the scientific method, most scientists have learned to avoid the stagnation that comes from accepting a fixed perspective. As a community of inquiry focused on the process of research, they have learned to become epistemologically open-minded, always seeking to discover new insights and new perspectives. When their concepts break down, they devise new hypotheses and test them. They challenge old assumptions, competing with each other in creative professional rivalry. Well, I don't know if Sir John ever read Reviewer 2. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure this necessarily reflects that. But, uh, but again, it, it is this idealistic picture of how science ought to work. Uh, and, um, but it, it also takes a long view on scientific progress. Um, one, as, as Susan was reflecting, that, that is informed by the, the history and philosophy of science um, over not just years, but decades and centuries. Um, he looked back, he, he wasn't a, a bench scientist himself, he, he was an investor, but he talked a lot and read a lot of historians and philosophers of, of science and, and was given this long view. Um, so these foundations, are they're not spin down sunset foundations, these are foundations that um, are, are there um, for perpetuity, just paying out 5% um, of our endowment each year. So um, even if progress is happening uh, just one funeral at a time, then uh, progress is still happening. But 
what if there were a way to speed progress up, to accelerate progress so that it, we don't have to wait for those funerals? Maybe it can happen within the lifetime of scientists. Maybe scientists can change their mind. And so this, this represents another theme within his thinking, uh, that of humility. So this is from an earlier book, The Humble Approach uh, from 1981. Uh, and, and here he's, he's actually quoting Vannevar Bush, the, the, uh, the chief architect of what became the National Science Foundation. Uh, so Sir John begins, being, being humbled before science is a good first step toward the humility we should have before God. And then quotes Vannevar Bush, uh, science here does things. It renders us humble and paints a universe in which the mysteries become highlighted, in which constraints on imagination and speculation have been removed, and which becomes ever more awe-inspiring as we gaze on the essential and central core of faith. Science will be the silence of humility, not the silence of disdain. So here, th th this gives you some insight perhaps into um, what one of Sir John's central goals was, which was to, to discover more about the nature of God, but that science was a critical pathway to, to doing that, uh, uh, a, a critical one. So perhaps uh, uh, as people think about mysteries, big questions, uh, the unknowns in, uh, uh, in the universe, this could make scientists more humble and have more, more awe, um, maybe willing to change their minds. So let's, let, let's, let's bring this back to the sort of work that, that you are trying to do. Um, how does our mission uh, um, as John Templeton Foundation relate to what you are trying to do uh, within this community of, of, of meta-science? So we share this goal of trying to accelerate scientific progress uh, of, um, thinking about the self-correcting nature of science. We're interested in the nature of science itself and uh, of scientific practice. And we're interested in uh, this idea of intellectual humility. Um, and I will unpack that a little bit, but I wanted to give you examples of some of the sorts of grants that we have made um, on each of these three themes. So first of all, is our support for the Center for Open Science? Um, we began supporting um, uh, uh, Brian and his excellent team um, back in, in 2014. And uh, uh, part of that has been to, to target and expand the, the build out and the improvement of the open science framework, uh, following on from um, what, what was started by some other funders, um, but also some meta scientific work looking, for example, at, at how, to, how to evaluate the impact of, of pre registration. But we're our motivation here was um, to, to achieve these goals of, of rigor and transparency, uh, of, of reproducibility in the work that we're funding across the board. Uh, and so if, if we want our grantees to, uh, um, to, to produce science that gets us closer to, to, to truths, then um, we need to make sure they have the infrastructure necessary to, to do that work. And, and we saw the open science framework as a, a critical piece of that. Uh, another example is, uh, uh, and a very different sort of example um, here on, on the nature of science is our support for uh, um, the University of Chicago's uh, knowledge lab and uh, especially their meta knowledge uh, research network uh, led by uh, James Evans there. I put the, the grant ID numbers here so that you can explore a little bit more on our, our website, if you like. Uh, another sort of um, science of science kind of project is, is to uh, um, Barabashi and Sinatra. This is uh, um, thinking a little bit about uh, genius within scientists. So this is taking a meta science approach to which scientists have influence and produce enduring and, and transformational knowledge. Uh, and as so a Barabashi and Sinatra taking this um, scale-free networks approach to that sort of problem. Uh, I mentioned this as well, just to, to, to demonstrate how some specific areas of Sir John's interests 
can show up. Um, so he, he had a, a particular bucket of funding on genius and uh, genetics. Um, you can wonder how those two might go together. Um, we, we generally break them apart in terms of, of how we think about those buckets, but uh, so in, in some of our support for work on, on genius, then this meta-scientific approach uh, shows up. Um, final set of examples is thinking about intellectual humility. And here are, are four um, either active or almost active grants looking at the role of intellectual humility in, uh, in the practice of science. So it happens that all four of these are on uh, um, psychologists, uh, um, but uh, there's nothing within our charter that says it has to be that way. Uh, but to this first team, um, looking at, so this is uh, Samin Bazir and Micah Rantella and uh, Alexa Tullett, looking at when do scientists uh, update their beliefs in response to new data? And what does it take for a scientist to change his or her mind? Uh, and does intellectual humility play a role in that? Uh, so this is this is one where we had this idea come to us, but but absent the intellectual humility piece, and so where we we talked with the applicants, could we add in? Um, would they be willing actually to add in uh, measures of intellectual humility uh, um, uh, 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 as part of their design, so that we could um, connect it better with our particular interests? Um, the same actually was true for the second grant to uh, Bethany Teachman and Charlie Ebersol, uh, uh, looking at whether, in the end, whether pre-registration, the act of pre-registration is an intervention that might increase intellectual humility. If you have to put your cards on the, on the table and say, here's, 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 what I, here's what my theory predicts, well, and it doesn't turn out that way, um, um, is that, itself uh, humbling and in, in, in a useful way. Uh, Kim Rios um, here studying, um, studying scientists who study religion and studying scientists, uh, what do they think about other scientists who study uh, religion? Um, does that relate to um, their evaluation of its rigor? And then finally, this isn't quite uh, formally announced, but um, I, I, um, I, I know it's uh, Twitter knowledge at least, um, this support for the Psychological Science Accelerator um, to, to expand um, what they can do, but within that also to look at how intellectual humility might relate to the sort of intuitions that scientists have about the generalizability cross-culturally of particular psychological phenomena. Well, I want to close by, by thinking about the sorts of things that we would be willing to support. Um, in, in the future and to, to sort of summarize some of those things that we have done in terms of uh, bigger questions that, that we could be interested to, to support in the future. So he, here are three. Uh, I, I have four more on, on a final slide. Um, so how and when do scientists change their minds? What does it take for a theory to die uh, rather than um, just uh, be, be, be resistant to to death. Uh, what is the role of intellectual humility in scientific progress? Uh, and then um, uh, this is a, a sort of specific example of, of a question about how science yields truths, but uh, people think about simplicity being a, a, a key feature of, of, a, of a good theory. Uh, but um, is that actually how it works out? Do scientists really uh, evaluate their theories on the basis of, of simplicity? Uh, um, those would be things that we could be interested in. Um, a few more specifically from the perspective of a funder. And um, we, we try to be reflexive in our grant making and, and to um, evaluate what we're doing and why we as funders are, are doing what we're doing. We're, we, we have lots to learn um, from, from our, uh, our grantee community and from, from our uh, other funders, including those on this call. Uh, but um, 
to do some of the things that we're trying to do, then uh, there, there are things that we, we don't have good answers to. So uh, if we want to direct scholarly attention to some neglected topics, how, how can we effectively do that? Why are some topics perennially neglected, even if they are um, central parts of uh, the human condition? For example, what does it take to get scientific attention on on uh, on those topics? How can we as funders help working scientists um, use good measures and good theories rather than just whatever is is, is popular? We all know those measures that just won't die. Um, well, we're using it. We know it's not the best measure, but you know everyone else has used it. We want our data to be complementary, even though no one will actually um, put it all into one one data set later. Uh, how do we make the the break to to the better version of the measure, um, or or the the completely new measure that is actually more rigorous? Uh, we we heard from Susan about interdisciplinarity, and and um, that's a that's a key interest of ours as well. Um, but how can we do that better? Uh, how can we help break down some of those silos between different disciplines? And then finally, just from an evaluation perspective, how can we increase the, the return on the investment that we give? So um, th those are, those are some, some broad remarks. I'll just leave you with a couple of uh, um, little quotes from Sir John about humility being a gateway to discovery and um, that it's okay to make mistakes along the way and uh, maybe even really helpful. Uh, thank you, I'll turn it back to you, Erin. Thanks so much, Nick. And especially, I think it's, it's very helpful to see those kind of concrete examples of uh, things that a funder might uh, look to support in, in MetaScience. So thank you for that. All right, uh, so again, just reminding folks, if you have questions to put those in the Q&A, uh, and we will move on to Dawid. Dawid, you have the floor. Hi everyone, I'm Dawid. Uh, thanks so much, Aaron, for uh, uh, moderating this discussion. Um, I'm going to start off by sharing my screen. Um, so uh, hopefully that is uh, clear. Um, uh, and, and I, uh, the, thanks for the introduction, uh, Aaron. So I, I, I won't say much more uh, except for that uh, my life, uh, uh, the introduction, the beginning of my life at a, at a funding organization uh, was actually to be hired as, as the very first program officer when Templeton World Charity Foundation started scaling up its grant making activity. And so uh, my, my perspective here as a funder is one of uh, learning about the whole process from uh, your strategy to grant administration uh, and also uh, one of making almost every imaginable mistake along the way. Uh, so with, with that in mind, I, I hope to share some of the lessons uh, that I think will be useful, um, maybe even a few points that, that could be counterintuitive. So um, let's uh, start here uh, with, with some flow diagrams um, if, if, if very oversimplified, uh, but but you know, please bear with me because I I, I think it's fun and, and and there might be something to be said here. Um, so you know to, to to the left here we can um, uh, think of you know on on a high level what funders do they come up with strategy uh, often by surveying the field and commissioning reports of various kinds. Uh, then they invite proposals to execute that strategy. And uh, they, they review the proposals and award grants uh, to a select few researchers. Um, and, and maybe here in the middle, uh, we can think of uh, as scientists. Uh, they, they find resources to let them conduct research. Uh, they conduct the research and then they report their finding. And then uh, to the right here, uh, we can think of publishers. They review the reports submitted to them. They curate approved ones in topics and with keywords that make them easy to find. And then they disseminate those reports as widely as possible. Uh, now, th there are two things uh, to say about this diagram. The first is that it's vastly oversimplified uh, and only really contains enough uh, detail uh, for the second thing that I want to say, uh, and, and that is, um, uh, something that I, th I think you know it's 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 sort of a bit, bit of an uncomfortable uh, thing to uh, to have to deal with um, 
but if, if you sort of uh, bear with me trying to explain it for a moment, uh, you see that when I started as a scientist, uh, and, and, and you know, for most of my, my career as a funder, I heard people talk about scientific discovery in terms of innovation, and indeed, you know, what, what we've heard so far, that that is what we do. We, uh, you know, uh, the, the scientific endeavor is one of uh, trying to serve a broader community by uh, uh, discovering and developing new innovations that can be applied in practical ways. Um, and, and, and that's great, but when we talk about um, uh, uh, research leading to new innovations or, or turning innovations into tools or interventions to help people, uh, we should ask the question, where does this innovation come from? And um, I, I, I know what, what I'm about to say is, is pretty unscientific, but it seems to be that uh, there's a general expectation that innovation comes from this middle box here in the center of the page. Innovation comes from uh, scientific research, new methods, uh, new tools, um, and uh, uh, you know, new discoveries coming from there. And if this is even remotely true, then to me, it seems like a bit of a missed opportunity and that you know, might, might seem obvious, but uh, it, it's, it's a bit weird that, that one would only have innovation in, in one particular case. Uh, if we look at other industries, uh, for example, one can see innovation at multiple levels. So for, you know, the Toyota in, in, in the 1980s made a name for itself because of their Kaizen philosophy. They had continuous improvement, innovation at every stage of the manufacturing cycle. Um, now, I, I'm aware that this is a measure science conference and, and I'm not showing you scientific data, but as, as an anecdote in, in support of this innovation point, um, uh, in, in 1996, when business strategy was becoming a big thing, Michael Porter wrote this famous article called What is Strategy in the Harvard, Harvard Business Review? Um, and, and even there, you know, an article about strategy uh, led with a very substantial section on operational efficiency uh, and this kind of Kaizen approach, the, the, um, uh, the, the approach that was pioneered by Japanese companies at, at that stage, innovating at every, uh, every part of the production process. Uh, what was mentioned as a necessary uh, feature for an organization to be successful. Uh, as a, a few other examples, uh, Netflix owes some of its success to this filtering algorithm that predicts what you might like to watch. And uh, that innovation came from uh, a crowdsourcing mechanism that offered a million dollars to the inventor of the best solution. Uh, or if you look at you know, other very successful companies in the world, uh, you know, ones that either make the most profit or best public benefit. It's really hard to attribute their success to factors that are not tied to innovation at different levels. Innovation in marketing, innovative technologies and products and innovative revenue models and so on. So um, coming back to this slide, I think there's you know, one question I often ask myself is, should we be content to strive for innovation only in the middle box? And I think it's hard not to ask for more. I, I think it's it's sort of you know, probably a, a a bit of an awkward uh, a position to, to to make in this conversation because it's it's tempting to dream of what broader innovation uh, could uh, could bring us in in these other boxes. You know, what if we could cut down grant application times by fifty percent? What if we could do the same for a publication timeline? Uh, what if we were better at uh, recognizing and funding the most promising uh, uh, risky projects? Uh, what if we were better at making sure results reached people who needed them most? Uh, I think it's very satisfying to strive for those ideals. And um, I think meta science can help us do that to some extent. So, uh, you know, recent findings that, that, that helped uh, us understand that funders and institutions could change incentives to promote more rigor. Uh, we've learned about room for improvement in review processes, the value of pre-registrations, um, and you know, application processes, things like uh, tying a, an application to a registered report, uh, to, to name just a couple of examples. And uh, I, I think that's a, a really cool thing to imagine that, that, that meta science might uh, uh, might bring to this field. Now I should just stop uh, for a moment and acknowledge that meta science is, is not going to be the only source of innovation. Uh, for example, journals and funders have increased their online presence to reach more people through proposals and publications. Um, 
as COVID-19 ramped up, we saw some funders launch a rapid response grants and some scientific reports undergoing expedited review. Uh, but, but putting that stuff to one side, I think it is easy to see, at least from my perspective as a funder, the findings in meta science can really help guide us to new innovations in the scientific discovery process. And that makes me excited. Um, I think it, it can help us improve some of the other boxes here on this slide. So that uh, with the overall outcome for human flourishing being better than it otherwise uh, would have been. And you know, I'd say that's a part, part of my perspective as a, as a funder and why I'm interested in the field. Um, so to you know, almost have it in a nutshell, I think we could, uh, uh, one can imagine using science to improve science so that better science can, can improve everything else. Um, and uh, with here, I'll sort of uh, stop, stop the screen share uh, and just talk about a couple of other points, because I think with, with that being clear, there are uh, two, two perspectives um, uh, that I think should be presented as, almost as boundary conditions and maybe a word of caution for some that I think align very well with, with what uh, the other funders have, have said here so far. Uh, the first perspective is on the difference between what we can imagine and what we can execute. So I'm very lucky to be working for a foundation uh, that has been quick to adopt new solutions. Uh, I've trialed numerous grant development mechanisms. Uh, we are able to quickly sign on to Plan S and DORA. Uh, we, we've launched this new structured adversarial collaboration uh, program in, in uh, 2018. Uh, we supported uh, a sub-grant competition tied to registered reports. We used pre-registrations, open reviews, uh, a range, range of other things, but uh, it's extremely difficult to do this as a funder. And even as a, as a private funder with relatively little bureaucracy, it's very, very hard. Uh, I'd love to tell you that it's just a matter of us getting our act together and that we'll do it soon. Uh, but I think the truth is much more complicated than that. Um, when I look at a batch of proposals, the number of ideas that deserve funding always exceeds the resources available. And uh, you know, in, in, in such cases, our decisions are not about funding or not funding a project. It's about taking resources from one opportunity in order to fund another. And you know, behind every application is a real person with a strong team of real people. And uh, you know, they they have uh, friends and families and bills to pay. And uh, uh, you know, with with that in mind, I think you know, our desire, at least my desire to innovate, has to be balanced. Uh, with a, a responsibility to be fair and, and respectful and cautious. Because, um, you know, e even small mistakes can be devastating. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, for that reason, it's, it, it, you know, it, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but sometimes even if an innovation seems really great, we can't necessarily just go and, and try it. Uh, we have to look for opportunities to do so safely. New practices can take times to establish. Um, they have to be reviewed by committees and tried on small scale and uh, then maybe rolled out more broadly. Um, and, 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 and there are also, uh, you know, we're, we're aware that the that, that practice uh, or policy that, that benefits researchers in one context may have either no effect or the opposite effect on another. And, and, and that, that could be problematic. Um, so, so that's all to say that, you know, I greatly appreciate the value of, of meta science. But innovation in this field really does take time. Uh, so, uh, based on that, um, I, you know, I'd like to offer a, a, a second uh, caveat here, um, which is that sometimes the pace of innovation is constrained by practical limitations, and not by the rate of meta science discoveries. So, uh, I, I kind of, you know, if the data existed, I would have loved to cite a meta meta science study on on how much you know, meta science would be needed to to uh, uh, match the progress of, of innovation uh, that's that's probably just uh, 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 overactive imagination but if it exists please please DM me uh, uh, but you know in, in 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 the absence of knowing exactly how much uh, research we need in order to improve the, the research process or how quickly we can innovate um, you know we, we, we have to guess and uh, uh, you obviously make educated guesses, uh, iterate, uh, and, and, and have conversations like these to think about it carefully. But ultimately, funders can't allocate more resources to meta science without first taking those resources from other areas. 
uh, it, it is a, a zero sum game uh, in, in, in many cases. Um, and, and then these decisions become very hard uh, when those other areas relate to cancer, COVID, other devastating diseases. So, um, you know, I, I absolutely agree with everyone here that, that more funding is needed for meta science. Um, that's why we funded this conference and uh, <laughs> a number of other projects. Um, but I, I think the, the point here is that we, sh we shouldn't despair if progress seems slow um, and, and that there would be little use in having um, the sort of meta science discoveries uh, outpace their implementation in, in this space. I think, I think there are almost uh, practical limitations here to how fast uh, the field can move. And, and I, by the way, I would love to be proven wrong on that. It's just, it's, it's my perspective. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if, if that's true, then I think this is partly a matter of uh, uh, recognizing that meta science activities could be limited by the resources available to us and, and the rate at which we, we can implement uh, best practices. But uh, the, the good news here is that this would also be an encouragement to the research community to translate new discoveries into concrete practices that benefit the community. I think, um, you know, so some of the people on, on this call uh, who do the research, uh, you know, it, it might be that by, um, uh, uh, through the way that you translate your findings and, and uh, the, the way that you know, those might be, uh, or the pace at which those might be adopted as new innovations that benefit the community, that could really help uh, bring funders and others along. So um, to conclude uh, from, from my perspective as a funder, I, I hugely appreciate that we need to innovate in a way that we facilitate the scientific discovery progress. Um, some of these innovations can be informed by meta science research, however, a lot in my view. Um, but even the most promising ideas can be difficult to implement. And the, the momentum in the field will likely depend on the context uh, uh, you know, to which it can be translated into practical applications. So, uh, you know, that said, I'm uh, super excited about this field and, and be proud to be working for uh, a foundation that, that takes it very seriously. And, um, you know, really looking forward to doing more work in this area and, and discussing these topics further with you. Um, so thanks again for, for giving me time to share my perspective. I'll, I'll now hand it over back to Erin. Thanks, David. Uh, that was great. And, and thanks again to all our panelists uh, for their for their contributions. Um, we're going to move on to the, the Q&A. We have about uh, 20 minutes. Um, and there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, and I also encourage uh, folks to add uh, to that. Um, so I'm going to just go in order here. Um, I think Susan had already answered one question there. Uh, so uh, Jeffrey uh, Mogul or Mogul uh, asks uh, or says, uh, you know, Susan points out that meta science would be more successful if it integrates into the disciplines it's trying to change, uh, rather than just becoming a new siloed discipline of its own. Um, so this integration, he says, I think is difficult because regular working scientists feel attacked or threatened by people attempting to change the rules or the incentives that have uh, served at least some people well. So he asks, is there a solution to this problem? Is this a situation where instead of trying to get buy-in from below, the better strategy would be to ad advocate for new mandates from above? So uh, I guess I'll go to you, Susan, first, and then if other folks want to uh, want to chime in there as well. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for that question. Um, I think you know it's it's an interesting point. I mean, how do you change how do you change culture? So do you first attack you know structures, or do you try to change hearts and minds? Right. I mean, so and and I think you know the answer with any dichotomy is both. Right. So I think to some extent the tone at which meta science research is presented, and I have found that it does not often um, use this sort of gotcha kind of thing, like, you know, you know, it has been quite sensitive to the idea that, that we, that we are working on a shared interest. So for a scientist to feel that they're being attacked, because they are using techniques or approaches that are not getting them what they want. Right. It's not that that we're, you know, I mean, they want to get gather and gain and generate knowledge that is um, true to the natural world, 
that is that might it doesn't mean that it has to be immediately useful but could suggest itself to be useful in the future i mean if you can improve the quality of the information that you're generating by being reflective on your own practices why would you not want to do this so i think yes there can be top down incentives to help and support and create a culture where this kind of interaction continually goes on. And then I think there, there'll be this bottom up and you're seeing a lot of bottom up. I think particularly young scientists who are coming into the field are really embracing these kinds of um, interactive approaches between meta science and empirical science. So I think, I think, it's, a, I think it's also a, a, it's gonna be very field specific, very generation specific, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that these changes can occur um, by, by both doing hearts and minds and, and sort of structural changes. Great, thanks, Susan. Anyone else wanna, wanna weigh in on that question? Yeah, Arthur. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm not, I worry, so I think it's a great question. Uh, mandates are, are strange, right? For one is for two reasons. Uh, even though we may share a kind of fundamental set of values about what science can do, uh, people study phenomena at different, you know, at, at different levels of understanding, at different levels, of, you know, of theory and things of that nature. So, um, kind of one size fit all standards are don't tend to be well received and, and don't tend to, to work very well. But I think that you know when communities uh, share a set of like um, values about how how they come to understand things, you can work from there. We've tried a different approach at NSF, and it, it's really to focus on um, like the outcome again, uh, practices in the service of an outcome. So, you know, things we've been doing at NSF is we require data management plans, we require to make the publications available and the assets available, unless it's, there's an ethical challenge with doing so. But like one thing we haven't done, and I think we'll never do is say, well, and you must replicate, or you must have a certain number of replications, because that doesn't make sense. The, the move that we've made, and I'll talk, you know, there's two of them that we've made recently is uh, we put out, I'll put in the chat, we put out a, a, a dear colleague letter, that's how we communicate with everybody about broader impacts. And what we've asked people to do in broader impacts is to be a lot more specific about the relationship between the research you're doing and how it's going to improve people's quality of life. And I think, you know, if you really want to deliver the mail on that, you have to talk about the things that we're talking about here. Right, so that's one thing we've done. The other thing we've done that some of your, some people on the call may, may think of as controversial, but I think it's in the same direction. We changed the science of science program. Uh, I'll just tell you personally, when I walked to NSF, I love what the science of science program could be, but what I saw in terms of what we, what we had funded over 10, 15 years, a lot of really good work, but I saw the dynamic that Susan Fitzpatrick talked about, that maybe a lot of the work was self-referential and not really penetrating out so we repositioned that program to focus on discovery, communication, and impact. And now we require you know, people in that context to really build the bridge between the work that they're doing and the impact that it can have. So I think pointing people to like the outcomes and the people and the quality of life, I think is, is a way to uh, respect community standards, respect diversity in, in the types of things people do, but motivate folks to create greater fidelity. Great, thanks so much. Nick or Dawid, anything to add on that one? Okay. Uh, so the next question we have is from Brian Nosek. So um, he's talking about a feature of some areas of meta science is this uh, social coordination of many researchers towards investigating a bigger problem than they could do uh, individually. So this can create challenges uh, for obtaining funding support um, because the collaboration is decentralized. Um, uh, projects may not fit with standard funding mechanisms. Um, he's referencing Nick's announcement of, of uh, Templeton supporting the Psych Science Accelerator, uh, suggests that gaining support for projects like these is not impossible. Um, so he's asking, what are the key concerns that grassroots projects like these need to address to become competitive for earning financial support? Uh, and maybe we could start with Nick on that question. Thanks, Aaron, and, and thanks for this good question, Brian. Um, so there's probably more answers to this than there are funders, um, because each, each funder uh, hopefully has more than one way uh, of, of doing this, but but probably different ways for each. But uh, I'll give the uh, a partial um, answer from our perspective. Uh, 
So uh, I think in general for, for us, a necessary but not sufficient condition is that the, the project in some way relates to a core theme of interest to us. Um, and there's a lot of those. Uh, so that could be innovation in, in general and understanding the, the, the history of innovation. Um, that could be something around a, a topical area like, like religion or uh, a character, something like this. Um, or um, uh, th th there'll be some other examples that are, that are st like that, that genius example I, I gave earlier. Uh, so in some way, linking it to one of those, perhaps using the study of that area as a case study for um, the broader meta-scientific advance that, um, that the applicants are trying for. But for us, um, it, it, it's also helping us make progress on that specific topic. So I'll give one other example, um, and that's the, the start of the developing belief network. So we, we've, this is a, a, initially a $10 million initiative, bringing together developmental psychologists um, across field sites around the world um, to do effectively study swaps, uh, protocol swaps. To how do we develop a, uh, um, a common suite of measures for basic things like theory of mind um, that could be used to do good cross-cultural work um, across these field sites. Now, why, why are we interested in that? Um, it, it, it's because we're interested in, in how children learn about invisible things like uh, um, that they children say they believe in, like gods or, or ghosts or ancestor spirits or, or what have you. But other people ought to be interested in that as well. Uh, how do children learn about other invisible things like electrons or germs? Uh, uh, and probably there's some similar uh, learning mechanisms involved there. So, so we've, we've, we've been able to launch the, the start of this um, platform to build the, the team science infrastructure, but we have constraints on our renewal and follow-up rules. Uh, we, this really deserves to go on at least another five years beyond what we've started. So we absolutely hope other funders will, will come to the table, whether it's uh, mainstream science funders, uh, federally or, or, or privately who care about science education, for example. So, so we're concerned to, to help design that project. So there are on-ramps for other funders who maybe don't care about the religion piece, but can see that, that this project advances a, a broader goal as well. So advance, advance a bigger goal, but also make sure that you're advancing one of our themes is, is my partial answer. Great, thanks, Nick. Anyone else wanna weigh in there? Yeah, Susan. Thanks, Brian, for that question. Um, I'd like to actually turn that question on its head a little bit. Um, there's this idea that there are these, you know, large um, popular, you know, communities of researchers who want to do this kind of research and are having difficulty getting support. I've actually found the opposite in our experience, that when we try to bring together a community of researchers, their own often parochial interests kind of carry the day. So they're very interested in their own project, but they have a, a, a difficult sense seeing how this fits into a larger program, right? So they may come to a meeting or be part of a, of a practice community and they wanna share what they're doing and they want to have what they're doing get improved from input from the group. But the idea that they are contributing to a collective accumulating knowledge that is going to make everyone's work better is a little more difficult. I, we have found that this is a little more difficult even when the foundation is funding this work and so therefore providing the incentives because we're often working against other incentive and reward structures, um, particularly within academic science that really rewards pair splitting rather than collective collective knowledge formation. So, so I think I, I think it's a I think it's a bigger problem that we we probably need to work on at multiple levels and to build multiple um, approaches and and senses of 
of trust and community that I think will might might take uh, you know to to channel Dawood might take some innovative <laughs> approaches that we actually don't have in place right now. But I think I think it's I think it's a bigger actually a bigger issue than than what Brian brought up. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, Arthur. Yeah, um to this question, I just want to talk about a recent change at NSF because I think a lot of people know that NSF has not traditionally funded very large uh, proposals in this domain or in the social sciences generally. I assume a lot of people here from the social sciences, but that has changed. Uh, the culture has changed with inside NSF where, where I think people, there's a real understanding now of what large scale social science looks like and can be. So uh, within a couple of weeks, we're gonna be announcing two grants. One is already sort of public, a $30 million grant that will improve the findability of a lot of types of data that people are looking at here, a single grant. In a couple of weeks, we'll be announcing a second $15 million grant that does a similar thing in the context of social media data, which will increase access while securing privacy and things of that nature. The, the key to all of these things is what Susan said, right? You've got to come up with a big sort of general vision of the service that you can provide to lots of scholars. You have to think of it like infrastructure as opposed to a single research project. You've also got to be able to tie it to a, a you know, very big societal concern. And I'll just say, if people are thinking about this NSF lane, not only has the change I've just occurred talked about, but Alejandra Recio in the questions talked asked if we could bring together you know, uh, higher education organizations, government organizations and private sector. Uh, NSF has just announced a new directorate, a new part called TIP, it's Transformation, Innovation and Partnerships. There will be a new funding lane there for that type of thing. So if people in the meta science context can find the intersection between infrastructure that really supports you know, a wide set of activity and meta science goals that brings in partners from these other uh, uh, other contexts, uh, there are great new opportunities there. Great, thanks so much, Arthur. And that's actually a good segue. So maybe we could go to Alejandra's uh, question. Um, if other folks want to weigh in on this idea of bringing together uh, higher ed education, our institutions, um, government organizations, and the private sector as kind of a, a collaborative group that could support uh, research in these areas. So anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, Susan. So Erin, I think this is actually something that you should comment on because this speaks directly to the Open Research Funders Group and the Roundtable at the National Academy of Sciences. So I, th I think you, this is this is your question. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll just say briefly. Yeah. So to, uh, Susan is referring to this um, National Academies of Sciences. Uh, uh, the Open Research Funders Group is collaborating with them uh, to do a roundtable on enlightening and incentives. And, and the idea is precisely this, that we have so many kind of stakeholders in this space. We have, you know, private funders, public funders, uh, universities, um, you know, private research institutions. Um, and what we really need to do is have kind of all of these folks uh, pointing in the same direction um, and, and really aligning their, their messages. So what can we do at an institutional level to incentivize, in this case, maybe uh, meta science, or what can we do at a funder level to coordinate that and also improve incentives? Um, so we are looking at that and, and trying to bring together stakeholders uh, from all these different areas, get everybody uh, kind of at the same uh, table discussing these issues and really finding out where we can get each actor to um, to align these incentives and, and move together as kind of uh, a coordinated group. Um, it's not it's not easy. <laughs> Uh, but it's definitely something that we're looking at doing, and I and I hope other folks um, are also looking at at these ways to to come together, so that we're not kind of working in these separate silos, but really uh, moving forward together. Yeah. So thanks for that, Susan. And I'll put a link to the roundtable in the in the chat if folks want to uh, more information on that. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this question? Okay. Uh, so, I guess there, there's a, rela a related question here about funders uh, from anonymous attendees. So, how much should, should the funders be kind of coordinate, coordinating their efforts uh, to better serve society um, instead of kind of uh, this uh, competition that often occurs? So, does anyone want to comment on that particular coordination among 
uh, funders. Yeah, Susan. So I think I think there is probably more coordination of around in between funders than probably um, applicants might know. I mean, you you've heard that we there are many of us here are involved in this this roundtable. We are part of the Open Research Funders Group. The Health Research Alliance is a an alliance of uh, I don't know tens of or not if not over a hundred you know disease specific research funders who share um, knowledge, best practices. Um, the James S. McDonald Foundation is part of something called the Brain Tumor Funders Collaborative, where private funders of brain tumor research, which is a relatively small field, are all coordinating our efforts. So I think, I think there's actually more of this kind of sharing of information that now goes on. But I also think there's something that we we have to think about it. And I've been thinking about this a lot. So this, this is often coached in the idea of efficiency, right? If we just pooled our resources and people could submit one proposal to everybody and then we could parcel these things out, wouldn't that be much easier? But then that gets to who makes those decisions and what, what something that the, found, that the James S. McDonald Foundation may find interesting may not necessarily be of interest to NSF, um, or it may not wind up being a priority for the Templeton Foundation, even though we on some level, on a meta level, let's say, um, have, a shared, have a shared or common interest, we're bringing to it, which I think is both the beauty and the strength of private philanthropy, as well as maybe a weakness, I don't know, but we each bring our own idiosyncratic Kind of point of view to this, which may mean that you get a greater diversity of research being funded than you would if you were doing it through a central process. I think one of the things we always have to be worried about is this, this dominant orthodoxy, because it's not just, oh, when the orthodoxy turns out not to be true, we'll just do something else. Oftentimes we've built an entire infrastructure around that orthodoxy, tools, training, <laughs> you know, um, research, you know, everything has been focused on that. So it's not like you can just pivot very quickly and say, well, here's an alternative hypothesis we can, we can review. So I think you have to keep alternative hypotheses alive in some ways and alternative approaches alive. And I think the best way to do that is through a very diverse and distributed funding mechanism. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's another one of these um, balances between what, what uh, of two dichotomies where, you know, the best approach is somewhere is finding, finding that, that angle of repose to some extent of where, where it might work best. I, I mean, that, that, this is a private perspective. Huh? Sure, my colleagues might have different ideas. Yeah, Dowd, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, very briefly. I think this this comes to the difference between what we can imagine and what we can implement. Um, getting such a large group of people uh, to to work together will be incredibly difficult and very expensive. And so, even if even if we can imagine doing it, uh, I, I think uh, there will probably also be wastefulness and and one then has to ask whether whether it's uh, worthwhile but more than that it might just be in, impossible to get so many many funders to to collaborate together all right well uh yeah Arthur did you want to come well, I wanted to you know from the government perspective I wanted to agree with you know everything Susan said I mean in terms of the the, the different approaches it really matters and it is you know, the institutionalization of, 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 of an academic enterprise, it is so hard to change. It is so hard to challenge. Um, and yet to move forward to advance in so many cases, we really need to kind of break down walls. You know, one of the things I'm so grateful for in the public private thing is, you know, at some, in some ways, NSF is, is pretty restricted. Uh, we can only fund, you know, basic or, or use inspired research, applied research, where there's a specific allocation, we're statutorily restricted from, from funding that. Uh, the flip side of that is we can fund things on five, 10, 20 year time perspective. And I think that's really hard for a lot of private philanthropies to do. 
right? So I think there's the mix, you know, we have these constraints and opportunities. The privates have these amazing sort of opportunities and foci and, and networks and things like that. I think the union of our skill sets, the union of our opportunities is so much greater than what any one of us have that, you know, I, I think, you know, to really push things forward to meet the goals we've all been talking about, it's that, that the real diversity of, of our sort of approaches, outlooks, and so forth that have, are the best hope for driving this thing forward. Great. And I think um, that's probably a good, we're right at time. Uh, so Susan, did you just want to make a quick comment? I just wanted to say very quickly, there was a question earlier about neglected areas of research. I think this is another place where private funders can often spotlight those areas by, by taking these smaller initiatives. I mean, it's very difficult for some place like NSF to sort of spotlight an area of research because of, of the responsibilities that it has to the broader enterprise, but we can do that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. So yeah, we are right at time. So I want to just thank everyone for an excellent panel and thank all the participants for their questions. And uh, yeah, so uh, a digital round of applause and I will hand things over to our organizers. Thank you so much.